first year of my PhD, so this should be sort of more like initial thoughts um, about my project and um, and um, yeah, I still have to do a lot more field work, um, so this is not really final conclusions. So just to put my research project uh, into a really brief context, the Spanish Civil War lasted three years from 1936 to 1939. Francisco Franco and his right-wing nationalist um, Catholic supporters failed the coup, which led to three years of the civil war against the left-wing supporters of the legitimately elected government of the Second Spanish Republic. This again led to almost four decades of Francoist dictatorship. Beltite is a small town in the northeastern area of Spain called Aragon. Beltite had almost 4,000 inhabitants at the time the war broke out. During the summer of 1936, just when the civil war began, between 150 and 300 persons were taken on a so-called walk and never came back. At this time, Beltite was dominated by the nationalist insurgents. Because of the closeness to the front, there was also a heavy exodus of people leaving Beltite. But it was not until August and September of 1937 that the Battle of Belzite put the town on the map through one of the most emblematic battles of the Civil War, the Republican offensive on the town, um, a siege that was meant to distract the nationalists from the northern front by sending more enforcement to rescue the siege of Belzite. But the nationalists did not respond to this and left the Belziteans to their own destiny. This literally meant a slaughtering of the nationalist rebel soldiers in Belzite. The official Francoist discourse after this was based on highlighting the Beltitians as heroes fighting for the national cause instead of being betrayed by their own side. In March 1938, the nationalist rebels again regains power over Beltite and Franco <coughs> promises Beltitians a new town based on, this, based on his own wish of leaving the old town as a proof of the Republican devastations. So this is built to before the war and after the war, right after the battle. And this is old Belzita now, so as you can see, the, the old town is actually like, far more devastated by the passing of time than from the, from the actual battle. When the war was over, the project for the new town was initiated through the official program called Devastated Regions. Meanwhile, people had needed housing because of the destructive impact of the battles on Belzite, many illegal evictions found place. When the owners returned after the war, they would find their houses occupied by other house households. And because of the newly established social hierarchy of victorious and defeated, no one would dare to claim back what was theirs. Others came to Belzite for the first time in their lives because they were accompanying families of prisoners held in the concentration camp in town. These prisoners, <coughs> were to build up the new town of Belzite. <coughs> the new administration had plans with these persons who needed housing. As a part of the official social assistance program, a set of houses were built three kilometers from Belzite to, ha to house the so-called Reds. Ethnographical sources relate that um, it was both the people who fled from Belzite during the war, who were now coming back, left-wing people, and also the relatives of the concentration camp workers who were sent off to live in this new housing complex. They were sent to live in what would be, what would be popularly known as Little Russia, where they would live until um, their houses in the new town were getting finished. This is not a concentration camp. There were no fences and no barbed wire. Actually, the inhabitants of Little Russia would still go, out, go to Old Beltite to trade, to buy and sell, this part is based on oral testimonies. So far, I have not been able to find any documents that refers or describes the, constru the construction of, this, of these buildings. No bureaucratic references, nothing. Well, the whole Francoist regime was a real military regime. Franco and his co-conspirers were military persons. So I find it natural that the antecedents of the structure and the aesthetics of the site are to be looked for in a military architecture. For instance, the power camps of World War I and other military camps. Simple functional structures built in straight lines, a barrack-like aesthetic with gable roofs. 
It also has some similarities to the special structure of the village built during the Frankist dictatorship, always with a church as the primary institution and pillar of the locality. All the gravel roads of Little Russia end or start next to the church. This composition is comparable to a teacher in a classroom in front of the class, which is exactly the role that the church would have in the re-education of the Reds. And beyond that, the church was to be in charge of the Francoist school system all the way up through dictatorship. Another not antecedent but parallel could be found in the so-called colonization projects. By the end of the war, landscape had changed quite a lot, and Franco founded an, an institute called Institute of Colonization in 1939 as a means of restructuring the rural landscape by creating colonies of new villages in order to bring labor <laughs> closer to the land that they were supposed to cultivate. Little Russia somehow fit very well into that idea, though the social implications go a lot further. The practicality and structure of this site also draws parallels to pig farms with its similar straight lines as a contrast to neo-medieval aesthetic that Franco adored. This parallel is highlighted, as you can see, by the easy adaption to the, of the buildings to the later usage as peasant storages and stables, which I will return to a bit later. The building materials reveals that the buildings were made with a certain idea of permanency. They were, not pre they were not prefabricated barracks, as were used quite often for the concentration camps. Um, concrete and bricks are more long-term building materials, so clearly there was an idea <coughs> that people living there were, go were not going anywhere anytime soon. Thanks to these materials, the buildings are still preserved in pretty good condition. Each of the three groupings consists in 26 single family residences and four commercial spaces, which makes room for a total of 78 families. It's maybe kind of hard to see, but well, the commercial spaces would be here, there would be three and three living uh, houses here, and then five in each of the wings, and the same pattern repeats in all three spaces. And over here is the toilet building. Each residence would measure between, well, around 30 square meters and is internally divided in smaller rooms. You access the living room with open kitchen directly from the street. There is a small pantry and two small rooms to which you enter through a door on the right after the kitchen stove. The toilets were in a separate building, yeah, which we just saw. So what, what is left? Mostly just the structures, some conserved better than others. The original wall separation and, and with original decorative paint on the walls. In the best preserved that I have, access, have had access to, there were also suit on the walls of, um, over the kitchen stove. You see it right here. Today, the place looks utterly empty, though human traces are everywhere. Inside, the bar has been a victim of long processes of post-abandonment accumulation. Layers and layers of garbage and stuff that could be considered an archaeological paradise. On the outside, as one of the few public spaces in Little Russia, the bar presents other traces of human activity carved in the wall, graffiti. A couple of graffitis can be traced to the period of the ghetto. One is a signature, Rosita, and it also says... Um, um, and the other one is a drawing of a chimney with the text spelling this is a chimney in Spanish and the year um, 1942. It's maybe hard to see, but this is the chimney. Well, this is just a speculation, but actually I find it that the chimney kind of um, looks a bit like the new tower of the new church that they were building in the new village in Belchite. Um, so if, if, that is, if that comes to be true, then both graffitis is engaging with Belchite, which I find really interesting. And there are also, um, uh, in other spaces inside, there are also graffitis, um, what would be a bit like Alex Hale yesterday called the rural quotidian, because they're just accounting systems, just accountings written all over the walls, for the people having their crops in there. 
other domestic objects and quotidian signs of life and absence, as the blinds on the outside windows and kind of insect screens have also been preserved. The remnants of civilians persist, but have also lost their power now that, that the civilians are gone and the site has passed on to new usage. So even though I cannot tell too much yet about this site, it is possible to analyze its social meaning. Franco's social assistance in this context became a paradoxical means of repression. The ones who were receiving help indirectly received it at a price. The acknowledgement of the new system. And if not acknowledgement, then at least surrendering to the new system. To live in these houses meant that you were obliged to attend to church and that you indirectly accepted the new social order and ideology. Francoist Spain thus used social assistance as an instrument of control, another expression of power and totalitarian domination. Clearly there was a meaning by sending this part of population into this kind of rural banishment. I also do believe that neither the remoteness of the old belt city nor the specific location were coincidences. The fact that they could watch some of the buildings from the old village would cause a homesickness that is part of the penitentiary exclusion. This is the tower of one of the churches from the old Belsita. On the other side, above the low area of the ghetto, a cross is placed commemorating the fallen during the crusade for real Spain, leaving the defeated to be identified with anti-Spain, another way of exclusion. <coughs> Up there. Um, this is really telling for the Spanish history until around the year 2000 that the defeated were not part of history. Their stories were not represented. The fact that the inhabitants of Little Russia were, in a way, surrounded by symbols that would constantly remind them of being defeated, the cross, the church, the old town, that meant that they were constantly being surveilled from all sides. And this is not a police civilians, but a rural landscape organized with material symbols of civilians. The social meaning of these materialities has left an inherited in civilians in the surroundings that is being effective as a repressive means through the idea of an inverted panopticon. Reclusion and isolation are some of the key thoughts behind discipline and punish. And it's, it's also connects to to this case in the way these persons were excluded and isolated from society in a most humiliating way. Francoism even goes further, the re-education and the remodeling of people to fit them into the authentic Spain. And it was not that the Reds uh, could not be religious, because some were and some had always been, but because of the heavy ecclesiastical implication of the civil war on Franco's side, religion and church did not necessarily go hand in hand. <coughs> All the gravel roads led to the church, who at the same time would play the significant role of re-educating as a redeemer. This process of exclusion, repression and re-education be, could be seen as a purgatory for these people who would receive redemption years later when they could reintegrate into society after transfer to new belt city. Based on maps of the architecture, of the architectural projects of new built city and maybe also structures of the old built city, it would be interesting to compare the houses and the change of conditions this rural exodus might bring with it. Not to mention how reintegration in, in the new village was and what kind of changes were significant to people. To some point, moving into the new town was a challenge to all built citizens, who despite their social conditions must have felt a certain um, displacement at first. Oral testimonies confirm that generally people never wished to leave the old town, but for the people relocated from Little Russia, it was not a new and equal beginning. So when Sarah Kaui uh, talked about environmental injustice the other day and how you can study differences of a neighborhood in terms of different views, bigger houses, more distances between the houses, well in Bilcite, this kind of thoughts were already um, <coughs> incorporated to the project from the very beginning. The richest and the most influent people and the most loyal to the Francoist cause would get the nice big houses around the central square. In that way, the, the town was built in a hier hierarchical way, um, from bigger to smaller houses. The project consists in maybe six or seven basic types of houses used in different parts of the town. At the periphery, 
the working class and the poor, poorest and the re-educated rich would be housed. So in a very physical way, the hierarchy was maintained. Also, the whole aesthetics of the new build is quite interesting and reflects the official taste of the regime. Because we do not just shape the world around us, but because that also goes the other way around, I would think that these people's lives were not exempt of repression from that time on. If you visit Beltide now, you'll still find a big phalangist symbol, the yoke um, and the arrows on one of the central buildings of the town. The locals tell that some years back the symbol fell down and some proposed to just leave it that way. But um, the story goes that Beltitians made a local crowdfunding, had a new symbol made and put it right up on that wall again. So you can yeah, see it on the picture. Right there. You can therefore say that the past and the conflict that goes 80 years back in time is still, still very much present in Belchite and a big part of the local identity. The old village is now officially being exploited <coughs> as a tourist attraction, though it has been a site of pilgrimage for many years. The guided tours highlight the barbarities of war and how both sides are victims, very much like the official discourses since the transi transition to democracy in the years right after the dictator's death in 1975. But no book speaks of Little Russia, neither does Little Russia enter, enter the tourist war sites of Beltite. It basically goes unseen. What I have been meaning to demonstrate with this paper is that morality can, at least in this case, act as a repressive means in itself, a means of dominating and re-educating in this complicated mechanism of control, violence and power that repression is. But I also wanted to highlight the importance of the archaeological inputs to the untold history and social injustices. I aim to somehow and to some extent secure just a kind of memory of this site so that the stories of the people living there can be told and keep living, even though it is just in a very small scale. In the future, I also hope to be able to say more about how day-to-day -day life in Little Russia was. My intentions are to dig up microhistories through the archaeological and ethnographic record, um, especially the microhistories that seem to begin to escape the local people's memory, and try to document some of the information that both people and the archaeological record can contribute with. This site, like so many other sites, are important to preserve and study because um, they represent the dark side of the, Sp the recent Spanish history that has been silenced for a long time. The dictatorship represents a one-sided domination of history which needs to be nuanced and balanced. Besides, the site seems to be a unique example of a ghetto as a repressive mechanism in this period of Spain. And in a bigger perspective, this kind of site hopefully helps questioning the validity of bas basic issues as democracy and human rights. That's it. Thanks. Thanks.